So I, I want to also uh, start with a disclaimer um, that I'm not really an expert in uh, all of those topics. Uh, there are lots of topics and I think people like me need to take a chance and try to talk about those things that they don't really fully understand because, well, there might be no one that fully understands this. Um, the talk is not about pedagogy and uh, I'm, I have no qualms about that. I'm trying to talk about something different than the previous uh, uh, panelists. And I'm asking a lot of questions. I don't necessarily have the answers. Um, I have ideas, but not necessarily all the answers. So to give a quick outline, um, I'll start with a motivating example coming from agriculture. So that's maybe a bit surprising. And then I'll talk about the mechanics of market and, the, and architecture together that lead to dominance of platforms in all kinds of areas. And of course, possibly in ed the education domain and the impact on, the on law and social norms that those platforms might have around teaching, and then present some modes of opposition or resistance, if you think that's necessary, to these trends. So let's start with agriculture. Um, in agriculture, there are some natural laws, uh, some laws of biology. It's the very much instance maybe of bean counting, uh, due to Mendel, who started looking at the result of breeding different um, beans together. And this, skipping quite a few years, leads to the Green Revolution, right? So this is the man who saved a billion lives. He didn't educate a billion people, but he saved a billion lives. He got the Nobel Prize for it. Um, the, the figurehead of the green, what's called the Green Revolution. But very quickly, in just maybe a few decades, the shift in natural laws led to something else, led to a corporatization of agriculture uh, with companies like Monsanto that started completely shifting the laws that drove agriculture. So for instance, now they develop crops that just give one harvest. You can't replant them to get the next harvest. Or you can start copywriting crops. So now all of agriculture gets summarized into information that can be traded, data that can be traded in some way or another. So just like George Siemens was saying earlier. So the shift in, agri in, in uh, agriculture, this shift in the natural laws leads to a complete shift in the business. So now field scripts here is another Monsanto product that just tells you, you know, just like the LMS tells the, the farmer all about their fields, where the yield is the highest, where, what crop to plant, where, um, all those things. So nice dashboards that really give them a lot of information so they know exactly which uh, seeds to buy from Monsanto to plant where. And that, incre that increases the yield, of course, um, but the tractors are sort of defective by design. The tractors that plant, that, that select for every square meter which, which um, seed to plant are also collecting a ton of data about what the yield is, and this data is shown back to the farmer, but is also collected by Monsanto from across different fields, of course, right? So Monsanto starts having information about not just one farmer's field, but all the fields in an area, so they start knowing information about the value of real estate or you know, f field estate at different places, which is extremely valuable, of course, once you start buying land. And the farmers, of course, they cease to be farmers. They can't, they can't fix their tractors if they consider they're defective by design because if they start fixing their smart tractors, the tractors just stop and they can't fix it. It's protected by copyright. It might be illegal to do that. Actually, just a month ago, there was an amendment in some of the copyright laws in the US so they can actually fix their own tractors because people anticipated that. But the farmers are starting to reply to this trend. They've identified the problem and they're uniting and they're sharing what's called the most valuable raw material in agriculture, <coughs> data. So I hope you can already see some of, the trend, some of the parallels I want to draw with education. So, but to try to theorize that a little bit, um, I want to use a framework presented by Lawrence Lessig in this book, Code and Other Laws of Cyberspace. So he presents four, uh, four actors in the theory of regulation, um, <coughs> architecture, market, law, and norms, social norms. And what he's really interested in is the shift that happens in this regulation when you start going online, right? So the importance that architecture starts to take on the way the whole market is shaped, on the way the whole regulation happens. So architecture in the physical world, what he calls real space, are the natural laws, like biology, like gravity, like things like that, that 
you and me can't control. But once you go in the digital world, then the architecture is really software defined. Right? And the software is written by humans, it's written by people who have their own goals and who can start framing, really defining the new architecture online. All right? So in the MOOC space, if I go very quickly, this architecture plus market comes together. And in the US, we often see MOOCs as a, as a source of funding for universities, right? We have this idea, hey, now we have software that can allow us to distribute courses to many people. We'll start offering them for cheap. But because there are so many people, that will be a big revenue. So that's a source of funding in the US. In Europe, where I am based, we don't do it really like that. We, I think many universities do it because American universities do it, and they feel like they have to participate. But we don't have the urgency that there is in the US to participate in MOOCs, which might be a problem, because it might be that the solution found in the US then starts to be forced in Europe as well. So we have less decision power in that, in that space, I find. So theorizing a bit more about this um, architecture plus market interaction, how do, how do um, what's the, the way those two work together to start regulating effectively individuals ask, acting in cyberspace? So another person who theorized that is Shoshana Zuboff. So her book, which is excellent, In the Age of the Smart Machine, details everything that happens when information becomes so important in a certain um, endeavor of work. So, but her book is really old, it's from the 80s, and she looks at blue collar workers, what happens when you start automating, when you start informating work, and she goes on to uh, white collar workers, and even though her book is really old, it still gives a lot of insight. And so she identified three, three laws that are kind of universal. So everything that can be automated will be automated. You already see this in MOOCs, uh, when you have automated grading and uh, all those things that are helpful to distribute content to a lot of people. Um, everything that can be informated will be informated. So that's essentially everything we've talked about today uh, so far, which is we collect data, we do learning analytics, we do all those things. The third aspect is that every digital application that can be used for surveillance and control will be used for surveillance and control. So we've heard a little bit of that earlier. The learning management system is a management system. It's something that universities do use so that they can control the way teaching is done and they can start surveilling the teaching. We don't want that. I think many people know that we don't want to build an LMS again or we can we want to integrate it with universities, yes, but we don't want to make the mistakes that have been made in the LMSs so far. So the question is, who will use this for surveillance and control if it's not universities controlling the teaching that's happening? So Zuboff has updated her book with a new, a new twist, which she calls surveillance capitalism. So it's something that we, you and me experience everywhere. Um, there is a new logic of accumulation of data that starts to take a lot of importance. And that creates a new form of capitalism that she calls surveillance capitalism. And that basically collects all the information there is to collect about a certain market. And that leads to complete dominance and complete negation of the idea of a market with an invisible hand working. Because someone knows everything about the market and starts really affecting it to its own ends. And the, the end result is that you have a few actors a distributed institutional regime of corporate actors, which he calls Big Other, that commodifies different facets of digital life. So education is just one of those facets. And it's a new expression of power renegotiating privacy and data rights, which is very important, I find, in the education space. So here's the, if everything I've said so far doesn't make sense, here's the map to maybe um, talk to other people. Um, this is the network of power right now in real space academia. So we have universities, we have professors, we have students. This is the core uh, alignment where universities do administration of professors who do teaching of students. There are a few feedback mechanisms like shared governance. There are horizontal networks that I've completely um, subsumed by those arrows. So student organizations that are a way for students to organize themselves peer review for professors, leaks for universities. And there are external actors like the state, corporate relations, or relations with corporations. 
um, rankings, like the timed higher education ranking. Um, that's the network we know. Now, when you go online, you start mediating a lot of interactions between those different actors. And that's a huge amount of power. As I said earlier, you can start using this, this power to, to architect the system for your own ends. So what Zubov does is that she reuses a paper of Al Varian, who is chief economist at Google, who lists four benefits of computer-mediated interactions. So it's exactly the Google roadmap for exploiting computer-mediated interaction. So the first one we know, data collection and analysis. Second one to personalization. Third one I'll skip for a second. Fourth is continuous experiments. So you always do experiments so you can inform what you're going to do next. We've heard about all those so far. The third one is the most important. The constant monitoring, you know everything that's happening, enabling new forms of contracts. That's key. The new contracts, what are examples of those new contracts? Well, it's Monsanto field scripts, right? So take this thing, I'll help you have high yield on your crops, but I'll also collect all the data so that I can know a lot more and use it for my own uh, ends. Uber is another example. Suddenly, you know everything about the location of people. You can start having two strangers, one driving the other. And if there are problems, you can have, you collect a lot of data and you can solve it. Uh, the Kindle, the Amazon Kindle is another example. So very few people know that when you buy a book on, on the Amazon Kindle, you're paying Amazon the price you see. But Amazon doesn't pay the author. Amazon only pays the author every time you turn a page. Right, so every time you turn a page, you pay a tiny fraction of a cent to the author. That's a completely new form of contract um, that the authors have to face. So now they are writing books, or they, will, they are about to start writing books in a different way, those who care about their revenue, because they want to write page turners so that people turn the page and they get paid. Right? So that's really completely different from what there was before. Another example is ad technology. So all the things that are behind the scenes powering the web that just track you all over the place so that they can sell data about your behavior online. So when you, it used to be, like in 98, when you went to the New York Times, that you just got content that they didn't know how to monetize. But now they know how to monetize it. They know that they can sell you ads that are personalized based on the data collection they've done, and so on and so on. And they can extract some revenue from that. Except that it's not the New York Times doing it. It's another company doing it for them. And that creates new problems. So this is the new situation. Um, this is, you know, we had the previous one. And the idea is now you're the platform, and you can reorganize everything. How do you reorganize it? So now you have just one platform. Let's assume Zuboff is right, and there is dominance, and there is very few actors that dominate each different facet of digital life. So there is one or maybe a few platforms. Now, Exerting power over them are different sources. You might have new types of ranking, like LinkedIn higher education. You might have the state still enacting some power on platform, like censorship that we see in some MOOC platforms. Data protection legislation. Politics also affecting that. Corporate, the funding sources of the platform are important. But also, the platform starts exerting power on students, professors, and universities. And the platform has no interest in keeping this power structure as before. That might be a really good thing, actually. It might be that professors need to be rocked around, and the same for universities. But the platform has its own interest in mind, not you know, creating a better education space in general. The platform has a mind? Well, the people behind the platform, for sure. So you can ask who are those people, who funds them, and all those questions. So how, do the how does the platform exercise power on each individual actor there? Well, the terms of service for students and professors, maybe some contracts for the professors, but also the partnerships with universities. That we know, that we can sense. But maybe the most important are the three thi thin red arrows, that the platform also exerts power on the mediation between different actors, right? And also the feedback loops that I didn't, uh, the, 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 the arrow from professor to professor, university to universities, et cetera. OK, so the platform has an opportunity to exert some interference. Which type of interference are we observing or are we likely to observe? The first, which is not computer mediated, is a trap of competition. To give the impression suddenly to the universities that they have to do MOOCs and they have to do it urgently. And we are the place to do it. Right? So now you all come to us and we create a new brand based on brands that have existed for 
over 100 years, most of them. So that's the trap of competition, but now it's, it's still being repeated with new options for offering course, new formats for offering courses, where platforms do call for proposals, where universities have to compete so they can offer sp some specializations. And the platform might even offer a loan to a university, so the university has the right to offer a specialization. And of course, the competition process is not transparent. The platform is also optimizing for user experience or time on site. I've never optimized for that when I taught. Right? I've never optimized for, I didn't, never wanted my course to last two hours instead of one. That has never been my goal. The platform might also optimize for standardization because that drives costs down, cost of maintenance, cost of exploitation of the data. So you can see at this URL um, a video where Daphne Collar compares Coursera to Amazon and their strategy to Amazon's strategy of hosting content. And um, that asks a ton of questions also when you compare with Amazon. So Amazon has um, a, what's called a monopsony. It's the only buyer for some forms of content. If you want to sell something, you have to sell it on Amazon, so you are able to do that. So Amazon is able to drive prices down, is, um, is able to force publishers to do certain things that they don't want to do. All the marketing data is accessed through the platforms, and that's often a problem. That might be the most valuable education data right now. It's all the email addresses that are being collected. And universities might not need to be able to might not be able to access all that data directly. The platforms can also segment peers and structure their communications. And finally, the platforms can also build new tools like search engines for courses, recommendations, rankings of courses, universities, and instructors. That's a huge amount of power. Think of all the search engine optimization uh, crowd, all that market. It's a huge amount of power in the digital space. Now this is the, mar the market and the architecture, and I've outlined how market and architecture can work together to lead to total dominance. What are the impact that we can expect on social norms and the law? So we, there, are very diff there are many different domains, um, ethics, trust, privacy, changing nature of work, and academic freedom. So let me go strictly through it. So the ethics, I don't want to say very much because it's very hard to say without um, without it sounding like an attack on people who are doing some of the research in uh, learning analytics. But I think there is a rush right now in using learning analytics without pausing and thinking about ethical implications of using those tools in the teaching we do. And in particular, some of the tools that are being suggested um, to be used are problematic from an ethical standpoint. So an example is digital nudges. Do I really want to be bugged all the time that I have to learn? Is this really the way we want education to go? That I would get emails constantly with you know, a Duolingo sad face showing me that I haven't gone and studied uh, in a week on Duolingo. Is that really a good thing? I'm not sure. It might be effective, but is it a good thing? And also, that's teaching online, but it also has an impact on offline teaching. So there was this study by Harvard or MIT, I don't, uh, I don't remember, where they um, were taking pictures of students, picture of student attendance. And some of the, and that was problematic because the students were not informed or the professors might not have been informed. Some people considered this problematic, I do. Um, but one of the justification was that this is what we're doing online anyway. Why not do it offline? That's a problematic justification. The end doesn't justify the means. It's not because we do it online that it's okay that we do it offline. No one has thought about ethical consequences online but that doesn't mean we shouldn't think about ethical consequences offline. So the issue of trust. You have forums where students can post anonymously, where professors are encouraged to post anonymously questions to initiate discussions. I mean, this is a breakdown of trust possibly between students and instructors. Um, there is automatic spam filtering in some forums. Sure, there are forums, there are online forums, there will be spam. But do we really want to have algorithms deciding on when it's okay and when it's not to post? I mean, who controls that? And then the trust is in marketing versus teaching. There is a tension there. I mean, a few days ago, I got a reminder from one of the MOOCs that I'm taking. I'm taking hundreds of MOOCs just so I can see what emails I get. And one of them was about Kickstarter. So this professor taught a MOOC and is now advertising his Kickstarter through the mailing list of the MOOC. 
that's, I mean, students can feel there is a mixed incentive there and that there is a problem. So privacy. Privacy is a very difficult topic to talk about because it's a heuristic term. We all have sort of a sense of what privacy is, but it actually has very different nuances. And just saying privacy is not enough. So in the MOOC space, in the US, FERPA does not apply to a lot of MOOCs, or at least that's what the MOOC, some of the MOOC platforms are claiming, because they have learners and not students. They're not universities. They're online platforms. They're tech providers. And this morning, when I was leaving. To be clear, the Department of Education has not said that. Right. Right, right. It, but the, the, the universities, some of the universities... I don't, I don't did they, read that and think that that's a statement of US law. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's a statement of some platforms on their reading of US law. But this morning I was leaving my room and I, I saw this sign, right? Privacy, please, uh, in my hotel room. I'm renting the space. I'm renting the room space. But I still have... This is my space, right? I still have an expectation that I would have some privacy there. No one can come and start rummaging through my, my stuff. Or actually, I have a way to express my consent that someone would do that, that someone would clean the space. So in the online world, it's not because universities go on a platform that they suddenly give away all the privacy rights of their own university, of their instructors, of their students by renting that space on the platform or using that space on the platform. Okay? In Europe, it's easier to have that those rights transfer with the person or with the usage because privacy is a fundamental right. And actually, this is a big warning sign to all of you. I think this is going to be an important issue in the near future, like within a year um, in Europe, that privacy versus US privacy law is going to be a big, big issue. This is informed by recent decisions. So which type of privacy is really important if there are all those different nuances? So intellectual privacy is the one that's most important according to me. So intellectual privacy is the protection from surveillance or interference when we're engaged in the process of generating ideas, thinking, reading, and speaking with confidence, with confidence before ideas are ready for public consumption. All right? So this is what happens in a classroom, in a classical classroom. I discuss ideas. If someone says something dumb, I'll play it down and I'll start talking to someone else. It's OK to be wrong. It's OK to say something wrong. It won't follow you your whole life as a data point that has been collected about you, right? And it's because it's okay, people express opinions. You can, they have baked opinions that others can build on, and all that is okay. But if you start collecting a ton of data and the students don't know what it will be used for, then that type of privacy is a problem. So another social norm is the relationship between um, education and the workforce, the workspace. So in the gig economy that we heard about, we heard a little bit about earlier, um, the gig economy matches up pretty well with the MOOCs, right? That's what we have heard. Um, but crowdsourcing or the gig economy, uh, when you look at low cognitive skill, is itself an area that is completely undefined, full of ethical concerns. And actually, by going to MOOC platforms, we're leaving some of the decisions on the linking with that crowdsourcing space to platforms and we're not deciding ourselves, universities are not deciding ourselves how that matchup is happening. So for instance, one of the things we can imagine in the near future are certificates that have digital right managements on top of them. That students would not own their certificate really, but they would have to pay a regular fee so that this is displayed in some kind of search engines for students with some skills. And there, we have no power to decide. It's the platforms that decide to partner with LinkedIn or whatever other things happen, and that's it. We have just, we have sold things to students, and then the students get sort of robbed by those new services that make them pay on a regular basis. Another thing that MOOCs do is that they rank students globally. This might be a good thing, this might be a bad thing. I mean, it's a very valuable information to know that you can hire someone in India or here with the same skills, right? So um, another aspect is academic freedom. So one thing that's extremely difficult to do is to criticize networks on networks that you're forced to use to distribute your own words. So journalists know this now. I mean, they're very concerned when they start writing about Facebook because they know that they get all their traffic from Facebook. So if Facebook doesn't like them, they can change their argument. They have no way of knowing. 
and they can start diverting traffic away from them and put them out of business. That's a problem. So the question for MOOC strategists is what happens when, what are the chances that Jeff Bezos would buy Coursera as a source of content, right? So if that happens, that changes the whole relationship between universities and the corporate world. We start relying on corporate actors to distribute our own words, and we start relying on them for sources of, of revenue. So that's a concern. I mean, that's a hypothetical question, right? But I think it's worth asking um, years ahead of that even possibility. But to go back to the metaphor of agriculture and education, um, I would like to think for a second of the students as the soil. So that's very dehumanizing, of course, for the students, but that's the point. It's to give you the point of view of the platform. So this raises a ton of questions that you should see the parallel with um, the beginning of my talk. So will the students reap rewards from all the farming we're doing, from all the education we're giving them? Are we helping others by mapping out all the different good students, by mapping out the yields for interests that we don't know? Do we control our actual tools or are the tractors we are using the, the platforms, the way to deliver our education, are they defective by design? Do we give sustainable certificates to the students? Certificates that don't just die out after a period of time, like after a year. And are we contributing to a loss of diversity in the agriculture space or in the education space? Are our tools selective in a way that is detrimental to some subpopulation? 